downtown Berlin, location of the Zeiss Planetarium. This is one of Europe's largest planetariums, and the city administration is making it one of the most modern. The news of the extragalactic neutrinos fascinates the director. To show them in the planetarium dome at the reopening would be sensational. Planetarium director Tim Florian Horn is a specialist in visualizing cosmic phenomena. Using the most modern projection techniques, he wants to make the latest developments and discoveries intelligible to his visitors. The Berlin Planetarium is a modern theater of science. Whenever anything new is discovered, we want to talk about it and show it. We can help people understand neutrinos best if we can show their path through the cosmos. That works very well in the planetarium because our audience gets an idea of the enormous distances in the universe. In real time, of course, they'd need months to fly through the solar system, so we have to suspend some natural laws. We fly faster than the speed of light to a place where, in reality, we would be destroyed by radiation. If we ventured beyond our Milky Way, we wouldn't be able to see other galaxies because our eyes weren't created for that. It's a narrow path we're treading. We want to be scientifically correct, but also intelligible for the audience. So we have to make compromises in scientific accuracy in the interests of intelligibility. Basically, we're a translation office for science. To visualize the newly discovered neutrinos, Horn meets up with the neutrino researcher Christian Spiering and a visual artist in the animation department at the Potsdam Babelsberg Film Studios. Their aim is to bring a cosmic neutrino to the screen, to make the discovery of an invisible object comprehensible to a wide audience. None of them knows what a neutrino really looks like. If we want to represent neutrinos, what can we show? How do we conceive of a neutrino? How might it move through the universe? I can only imagine how a neutrino moves, and I imagine something like the trail of a jet plane without seeing the plane itself. I'm really only interested in how and why it flies its path. Or I simply imagine a neutrino as the Greek letter Nai. That's enough for me. Basically, I only see a formula. On this issue, I ask myself, where do they come from? How do they move? How do we show that? I'll make a suggestion. I'm the neutrino. I fly through the room. Yes, a subjective flight might be the answer. I race through the universe, various galaxies approach, I leave them behind, then comes empty space, just empty space, then at some point our galaxy turns up and then a blue sphere in the distance, and that's the Earth. So far, Spiering has only thought of neutrinos as particles without a shape. The visual artist presents him with various ideas. That's more like an atomic model, certainly not a neutrino in my understanding. For me, a neutrino is more like a point without structure, very tiny. Okay, next suggestion, a model that shines and appears to be intangible with an external oscillation. <laughs> that looks more like friendly elves oscillating around a green sphere. With green vibrating bands, I understand. This one's interesting, out of focus. Makes me think immediately of solar eruptions. 
Of course, we also have the problem that certain images are already familiar. This one probably looks like Star Trek. It wafts around indecisively in space. And it looks very wound up. Yes, very excited neutrino. Previously, I saw something interesting in the computer preview, a sharply defined sphere, rather like a billiard ball. If those edges could fray out or blur, I think we would be closer to the ghostly particle. For me, it's just a bit too big in relation to the screen. No problem. So, yes, like that. Let's try that. In the Center for Particle Physics in Marseille, the French research team is getting ready to install the first KM3 net detector chain. These are the, the eyes of the, the telescope, and the photomultipliers are very, very sensitive to light. They can catch just one single photon. Uh, the human eye actually requires about seven photons before you can trigger that you've detected something, whereas these are much more sensitive than, than the human eye. And we need to measure the position where the photon arrives on the, on the detector with a few centimeter precision. But of course, in the bottom of the sea, uh, we have the sea currents and, in fact, everything is slightly moving. And so in, inside the uh, optical module we have some very precise compasses which measure the rotation of the sphere and its inclination uh, in, in all directions. As soon as a neutrino hits the nucleus of an atom in the detector, it races on as a myon. The myon emits light and activates the individual sensors on its flight path. From the direction of the flight path, the researchers can reconstruct the position of its source. The amount of light that we uh, detect in, in the telescope actually depends on the, the energy of the neutrino. So if a low energy neutrino was to interact, there wouldn't be very much light, uh, whereas when it's a very high energy event, the whole detector will be, will be lit up like a, a Christmas tree. KM3Net will be a powerful deep-sea detector, the counterpart of IceCube in the Northern Hemisphere. Each detector string is 800 meters long and carries 18 sensors the size of basketballs. So if you were able to walk around on the seabed amongst the forest of detectors, I think it would be quite an impressive sight to see. The telescope is not rigid. It floats on the water current. So every sensor has to continuously redefine its position. That's the only way the researchers can determine the direction of the neutrinos. Back to the animation studio. From the planetarium, Tim Florian Horn has brought a software program that can simulate the known universe. In these vast spaces, the team tries to create a dead straight path for the neutrino, from its source to the Earth. A graphic card or a computer system can't represent these large scales sensibly. We have to be a bit cunning. We'll compress the various coordination systems and we'll fly much faster than light. When we're crossing matter, whether it's the Earth or an asteroid, it would be good to try and zoom in on the atomic level. I mean, the level where, as a neutrino, I only see an atom in front of me, the nucleus in the center with a few electrons circling it. Because at the end of the day, an atom is an empty system through which the neutrino flies completely unhindered. Basically, the whole of Earth consists of these empty systems, and that's why it's porous for the uninvited neutrinos. 
The atomic level should show why the neutrino can fly unhindered through walls and whole planets, a flight through the void. In Marseille, the researchers are preparing to transport a detector string. Here we have the structure we use to install KM3 net at a depth of four kilometers in the Mediterranean. The KM3 net sensor lines stretch hundreds of meters high vertically from the seabed. 800 meters when set for the higher energies and 200 meters high for our setup here in France. But before installing these vertical structures, we first wind the cable, which is a flexible cable, onto this spherical structure. Every action is carefully planned and tested several times. The scientists roll the string with the sensor spheres into a big ball. They have developed a special anchor to secure it on the seabed. The final step in the construction hall is to load the rolled up string onto the yellow anchor. The first sensor chain is ready for shipping. Together with the anchor, it's loaded and sent off. A research vessel transports it 40 kilometers offshore. Tonight, the first KM3 net string is due to reach the bottom of the Mediterranean at a depth of 3,500 meters. Slowly, at a speed of 12 meters per minute, the anchor and sensors sink onto the seabed. They are accompanied by submersible robots steered by engineers on board the research vessel. Four and a half hours later, the load reaches the bottom. Robotic arms attach cables linking the anchor with the deep sea infrastructure that transmits energy and information to the coastal station. Then a boy hoists the frame. The sensor string unwinds vertically from the metal frame like wool from a ball and releases the individual photosensors to their specific final positions. Assembling the first detector string is successful. Many hundreds more will follow. Soon, KM3Net will also be able to identify extragalactic neutrinos. In the Berlin Planetarium, the researcher animation team wants to take a look at its first results. A cosmic premiere screening. Scientists view the universe as a gigantic laboratory for testing the validity of the basic laws of physics and to investigate regions in which gravity, density, and temperature are extremely high. There where stars explode or implode and a black hole is created. A cosmic explosion in a gigantic particle accelerator a million light years away. An enormous jet sent out by a gigantic black hole in the heart of an active galaxy. These jets can reach hundreds of thousands of light years into intergalactic space. They accelerate the cosmic particles, thereby producing neutrinos. A neutrino flies slightly slower than the speed of light. Since it comprises only a smidgen of matter and isn't charged, other particles don't decelerate it or distract it from its flight path so it can pass through everything without risking a collision. Atoms of which our bodies are made 
consists of more than 99% empty space. Between the nucleus at the center and the even tinier electrons circling it, there's a great deal of space for the neutrino and nothing but an electrical field. But unlike most other particles, the neutrino doesn't register electrical forces. It has to collide directly with a nucleus for it to be stopped. And that occurs very, very rarely. This rare event can only be discovered with the aid of gigantic detectors. Only by chance and with the slight risk estimated by the scientists does a neutrino strike an atomic nucleus. Now these extragalactic neutrinos have been identified for the first time. Ernie and Bert are the megastars of astro and particle physics. In discovering cosmic neutrinos, we have opened a new window. However, we haven't opened it fully, just a crack. We know there's something there, but we haven't mapped this new landscape yet. When we find more of these particles and trace them to definite sources, we'll be able to create a mosaic. And then we'll be able to say how these sources really function, how the wildest machines in the cosmos work. Modern physics shows that the behavior of elementary particles at the smallest level and the development of the universe as a whole are inseparably linked. With models and theories, scientists are trying to gauge and extend the boundaries of physics. Neutrinos will help to prove those theories. to discover a single point-like source of neutrinos. Um, so that, that could be uh, sources like uh, black holes, uh, accre accreting uh, matter, uh, collisions of black holes or, uh, or supernova explosions. To be sure that we uh, detect such a source, uh, we would need something like 10 neutrinos pointing from a a single location in the sky. Uh, history has shown that every time you switch on a new telescope, uh, you should, should not be surprised to have a surprise. Venice. If there are highly developed civilizations, perhaps they don't want to be spied on by underdeveloped civilizations like ours. Maybe they decided not to use electromagnetic waves to communicate, but something quite different. For instance, neutrinos. Just imagine. That would mean that neutrinos are something like Morse code from extraterrestrial civilizations. 